Uh, hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Dave Chancellor, and I'll be your host today. So uh, we are going to be talking about racial wealth inequality, and to do that, we're going to first hear from uh, Dr. Fenaba Otto, who's going to be talking about the precarity of the Black middle class, and then uh, Dr. Jacob Faber uh, will talk about policies that have led to the creation of the U.S.'s racial geography, and finally, uh, Dr. William Darity will make the case for a federal reparations policy today. So I so appreciate all of our guests being here and uh, for all of you being willing to share your work with us. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their support of this webinar series. That said, any views expressed in today's webinar aren't necessarily those of ASPE or the Institute for Research on Poverty. Um, so I want to give us a quick kind of rundown of the show today. Uh, each of our presenters is going to take about 15 minutes for their presentations, and then we're going to save the final 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar uh, for your questions. So you can see that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to type your questions in throughout the webinar today, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can before our time's up. Um, we also have the chat box open today, and uh, I see already a couple of you have found that, and you're welcome to join in the conversation that way. Um, if you have things that you want to share uh, or just other ways that you want to interact. So, um, and I do want to note that we are recording today's webinar and I will plan to have a recording uh, of the webinar out to all of you that registered uh, by later on this week. So you can check for that in your email. Uh, so with that, let me introduce Dr. Fenaba Otto, who's an Associate Professor of Public Policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Dr. Otto is an IRP affiliate, and she's also a co-author, along with Dr. Darity, of a chapter in a volume of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences. Uh, that'll be coming out later on, a bit, about, a, about a month or so, I think that's right, right? Uh, so uh, Dr. Otto, thank you again for being here. I'm going to invite you to uh, share your slides now. and. Uh, uh, and the rest of us will turn off our cameras, okay? <laughs> Always got to turn on the sound. Thank you. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Thank you, Institute for Research on Poverty, and thank you, Dave, for helping us to organize this session on this very uh, important topic. I'm looking forward to the other presentations. Um, so I, um, this afternoon, I was tasked with presenting recent work um, that focused on racial wealth inequality with a specific focus on the Black middle class. So uh, this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to show uh, some results from some studies that we've done that really argue that the black middle class maybe is fundamentally different than the white middle class and that focusing on wealth rather than other um, often used metrics for assessing so socioeconomic status is better for kind of understanding these differences. So why are we focused on wealth? Wealth is necessary for we, we know for buffering against household shocks. It allows individuals to plan for the future and in a society with uh, almost non-existent social safety net is essential mechanism for financial security and individual and fam familial well-being. Um, wealth inequality in particular is large, persistent, and intergenerational. So we'll come back to that um, in a bit. Consequently, we believe and that we argue that wealth is a far superior metric for understanding class structure in the United States, and in particular, what we will call the subaltern status of the Black middle class. You can see in this chart here that um, the cumulative wealth of black households in the, in the United States is the same as the bottom half of the white wealth distribution. So black Americans account for about 13% of the US population, but hold about le less than uh, 3%. It's actually about 2.6% of the overall wealth in our, in our country. So for the first study, uh, which is collaborative work, I want to acknowledge uh, with Professor Darity and uh, Amari Smith. We lay out this argument for redefining the Black middle class as the subaltern group within the broader US society. Why are we using this word subaltern? Subaltern here is used as an alternative or a replacement for the term minority, which is often uh, you hear quite a bit in our, our regular di dialogue. Substantively, uh, the subaltern is understood as any person due to their membership in a stigmatized group, um, it, it, who due to their, excuse me, their membership in a stigmatized group is assigned an inferior social status or rank. But their inferior status may not apply under all contexts or under all criteria. The black middle class, we argue, are subaltern for at least two reasons. The first is that their financial wealth status precludes them from ever being upper class according to the US wealth standards. And second, because their economic position does not translate 
into similar rewards as their white American counterparts. So why is this the case, right? Simply put, they are not immune from the discriminatory and exclusionary practices that reinforce social class hierarchies, nor are they buffered from adversity. So there's a lot of uh, great uh, and, uh, research and, and studies um, that kind of highlight this, uh, that we're, that, uh, this point that we're underscoring. So one being that higher relative status, class status may not reduce racialized stress for a subaltern groups. When we work from Arlene Ger Geronimus and her colleagues have shown that uh, white Americans with a poverty income ratio that's less than 1.85 uh, have lower allostatic uh, load scores than black Americans with poverty to income ratios above well, 1.85. So, um, you know, just seeing that uh, higher, experiencing great, uh, greater, uh, greater stress, um, does, uh, having, excuse me, uh, experiencing greater stress um, um, among uh, black Americans who are uh, not as, uh, not as impoverished. We also see that health outcomes for high um, socioeconomic status black Americans are often worse than lower socioeconomic status whites. Um, one example I'll draw on here is that infant mortality rates are higher for black women with a graduate degree than white women without a high school degree. And third, uh, racial disparities also appear to persist within socioeconomic status. So some of the work that uh, Professor Darity has done with some of his colleagues have shown that the likelihood of future incarceration rates are higher for black Americans at every wealth quintile compared to white Americans. So when we start to think about uh, the black middle classes existing as a subaltern status, it captures the fragility of their position and underscores the black middle class position as this influent sector among a marginalized community. It also, with this focus on wealth reveals extreme economic inequality, whereas a focus on income tends to mask it. So in this slide, you see on the left-hand side, um, the median income distribution by income quart, quart, uh, quintiles. And on the right-hand side, we see the wealth distribution by wealth quintiles. And you can really see that the differentials when we look at wealth are much greater than the income distribution. We also see um, that the percentage of black and white Americans um, are quite different when we look at wealth quintiles across uh, the wealth distribution in the United States. So black households are concentrated at the lower ends of the wealth distribution. So for example, in 2016, the median household income was around $97,300. About 64% or close to two thirds of black households had net worths that were less than the median. And the top where most of the, uh, the top of the black wealth distribution it really kind of sits in the middle of the US wealth distribution. But this means that, you know, if we think about it is that their kin and their communities are more likely to be located in those lower wealth quintiles or that bottom of the distribution. So yes, the black middle class is economically fragile. And we see this manifest in, uh, in, in lots of ways. Their class status in fact is quite precarious. Um, work we see, um, on, um, up, on mobility suggests that there's greater intergenerational upward mobility for white Americans than black Americans born in the bottom of the income distribution. So again, we're looking at, you can look at income or wealth um, here. And we see that um, white Americans born in the top fifth of the income distribution have higher um, chances of staying um, at the top of their distributions than black Latinx or native Americans. Uh, in other work, uh, done by uh, uh, Fabian Pfeiffer and Sasha Kilwolf has found that black children in the middle, 20% of their parental wealth distribution are 2.4 times more likely to, likely to experience downward mobility um, than their white counterparts are more likely to fall to the bottom of their uh, wealth distribution. And in some, oops, excuse me, in some of the work that I've done with my colleagues, uh, Jason Fool in particular, we see that black young adults hold about 10.4% less wealth relative to their um, white counterparts due to higher student debt burden. So the white, 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 black uh, student debt disparity is contributing to uh, uh, a 10% um, difference in the wealth, uh, racial wealth gap among young adults. So just as income can um, kind of mask severe economic inequities, education, um, which is also another common metric of socioeconomic status, is again, no panacea. So this, in this chart, we show that the median net worth of black and white households by educational attainment. Just wanna highlight one, um, one thing here is that the typical black household 
headed by someone with a college degree have less wealth than the white households with less than a high school degree. So I'll conclude with uh, drawing on uh, the paper that Dave mentioned in the introduction that is forthcoming, um, in which we are looking at the relationship of uh, working class households um, and, and race um, in the post Great Recession period. Um, in addition to providing some up-to-date estimates with regard to this relationship, we are also interested in assessing the relationship between working class status and this wealth-based metric of middle-class attainment. And again, looking at um, how it varies by race, race and ethnicity. Here we define working class as someone who um, is employed by someone else and did not hold a managerial or a professional um, occupational status. We see one that although working class households comprise the majority of households in the labor force during this period, the shares differ um, by, by race and ethnicity. So among the black households, uh, uh, close to about two thirds of the labor force participation was uh, uh, among this working class group and among the Latinx households, uh, over three fourths of, of their households fall into this categorization of working class. Um, we also see during this period as the, as the economy was improving that the wealth threshold, so if we focus in on the third quintile here, so around, um, I'm highlighted here right here, we see that as the economy improves in order to qualify, right, for middle-class status, um, that threshold is actually increasing over time. So we look at, um, you know, who was able to meet this bar, who's able to meet this threshold of middle-class status among black and working class households, um, there's actually a decline. So fewer, as the economy improved, fewer uh, black households were able to meet this, this middle-class threshold. Um, and, and we see this decline um, over time. Also, we see that almost two thirds of the white uh, working class households were, act, were able to uh, meet that threshold um, both at the beginning of that or the beginning of the post-recessionary period and towards the end um, around 2019. So we find that working class households are less likely to be middle class, um, but also that black and Latinx households are also less likely to be middle class based on their uh, net worth and that the professional class are more likely to be middle class as well as white working class households. So just to conclude, um, you know, I've presented some uh, some results from studies that we've done over uh, the last few years, kind of showing or making this argument that to be black and middle class is to assume this subaltern status within the United States. So being this kind of fluent tier of a marginalized community that is not immune or does not buffer oneself from immunity from, I mean, from, uh, excuse me, from adversity, from discrimination and from exclusionary practices um, that would buffer, buffer them um, via their class status. Um, we also see that the black middle class are economically fragile and that this, um, <clears throat> and that they, uh, their status declined as the economy improved, or the percentages that were in that group declined as the economy improved post-recession. Uh, post um, and we also think, need to think about um, or propose policy solutions that address the massive wealth differentials. As I showed at the beginning, the chart of the massive difference in the cumulative wealth that is held by um, Black Americans compared to, to white Americans. Um, we targeted programs that are addressing this massive differential might be one way to kind of remove the subaltern status among the black middle class. So thank you and I'll stop there and pass it on to Dr. Faber. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Otto. And um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Dr. Faber now. Uh, so uh, you are an associate professor of sociology in a public public policy at NYU's Robert F. Wagner School of Public Policy. And, uh, and you're also an IRP affiliate. And we're, we're super proud to note that we were able to support some of your earlier work uh, when you were an IRP Emergent Poverty Scholar Fellow. Um, so we're just glad to have you here today. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Um, thank you, Dave, uh, for inviting us and pulling this together. I'm going to Make sure get all set up here, sharing screen. Um, I hope you can see my slides now. Um, so uh, as, as, um, as Dave mentioned, um, I am interested in studying the causes and consequences of, uh, of, res of racial segregation. Um, and I'm gonna share some work that I've done showing the, uh, the enormous role that federal housing policy has played um, in, in segregating um, Americans intentionally. 
So, um, you know, when we kind of ask people about segregation, um, as we look at this um, map of, um, of racial isolation in and around New York City, um, we tend to get responses um, about how, you know, people just like to live with people by themselves or, and occasionally people will point to socioeconomic status differences uh, between races, for example, because um, African Americans tend to be um, uh, poorer than whites that can't afford to live in, uh, in the same neighborhoods. Uh, and there's certainly uh, some truth to both of those ideas, but there's rarely a recognition of the role that uh, public policy has played in shaping America's racial geography. And the, the truth is that for almost a century, government policy uh, has had an enormous influence on where people live. Uh, and for a long time, that policy was um, explicitly encouraged um, segregation by, uh, by race. So to understand the underpinnings of today's racial geography, we have to go all the way back uh, to the Great Depression. Uh, we commonly think about the Great Depression as an, as an employment crisis, and it certainly was, uh, but it was also a housing crisis. About half of mortgage debt was in default in 1933, um, and millions of people became homeless. In response, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, with the help of large Democratic majorities in Congress, enacted uh, a wide range of policies known as the New Deal. Um, we see in this political cartoon here, um, FDR treating um, an ill Uncle Sam with dozens of New Deal remedy, remedies displayed in their uh, now famous acronym form. Uh, these were enormous job programs. Uh, this is the birth of the American social safety net. Uh, there were labor rights and union protections that were part of the New Deal. Uh, and there were also massive investments in housing, um, including the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, or HOLC, um, depicted here in the, uh, the center of the table, um, as well as the Federal Housing Administration and uh, later the GI Bill. Um, the, uh, the, so Hulk was um, intended to be uh, foreclosure prevention. It uh, allowed people to um, get find, uh, uh, grants from the federal government to um, uh, avoid foreclosure or buy back um, foreclo uh, foreclosed properties. The HOLC and the FHA together created the um, uh, kind of an, a, a financial insurance system that was responsible for creating the American Homeownership Society through the institutionalization of the long-term uniform payment mortgage. And it's worth pausing to emphasize how important a change this was. Uh, prior to Hulk, there was there was no standardized mortgage credit. Um, if you were wealthy, uh, you would buy homes with cash. Um, you were otherwise reliant on what some historians refer to as a uh, kind of patchwork system of mortgage policies, often requiring enormous down payments and, and high interests. So not only did Hulk save an, an industry in distress, but it established the primary tool for wealth accumulation for most Americans, the, uh, uh, the long-term fixed payment mortgage. Uh, and as, as Fenneva said, uh, you know, wealth can appreciate over time and be tapped when income is inconsistent and create opportunities for intergenerational mobility. And this is in large part why the, the racist design and implementation and inheritance of the Homeowners Loan Corporation are so important to um, what we see today in terms of racial inequality. So uh, one of the things that Hulk did was um, now that the federal government was in the mortgage lending business um, is it sent um, hundreds of appraisers to hundreds of cities around the country um, to appraise the lending risk in, um, uh, in various neighborhoods in those cities. Um, and, uh, and so these appraisers made these maps, uh, the now infamous redlining maps. Uh, they were called residential security maps at the time. Um, and appraisers uh, graded neighborhoods from A being the best grade, and these are in green, and D being uh, the worst grade, uh, and these are in red, and this is where the term redlining came from. Uh, that you know, uh, because of uh, of these federal appraisals, 
um, uh, became much harder to get um, a mortgage finance in uh, in these neighbor in these neighborhoods over the course uh, of generations, if not impossible. Um, and grades were based on uh, a number of things: housing conditions, economic activity, and perhaps more important than anything, um, race. Uh, appraisers, and we know this because appraisers provided uh, these rich descriptions of um, of every neighborhood that they graded. Um, and I'm going to show an excerpt from um, uh, this uh, uh, redlined neighborhood here in um, in downtown Atlanta. Um, so. Again, in addition to the grades, they provided these long descriptions of neighborhoods. This is only about a quarter of the description of this one neighborhood. Uh, and at the top of these appraisals, you'll see favorable and detrimental influences uh, of this neighborhood. And under detrimental influences is income instability, infant mortality, crime, and uh, mixture of racial groups. Uh, you'll also note that under uh, beneath that under the description of the inhabitants of this neighborhood that uh, percent Negro is the uh, is the only racial category here. Um, Nathan Conley, Ken Jackson, uh, and others who have conducted deeper analyses of these narratives have documented um, a preoccupation, uh, if not obsession, of appraisers with the presence of Black households, that a single Black person living in your neighborhood uh, could guarantee um, a D grade. Um, another uh, kind of fun um, uh, and an illustrative uh, historical archive excerpt here is um, this uh, uh, this brief passage from the Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual, which um, um, guided appraisal practices uh, as well. Um, and here on page 980, we uh, we see um, prohibiting um, pig pens as well as um, kind of undesirable races here as um, uh, as just kind of back to back uh, uh, and the the banality of this racism is really um, in 2021 pretty uh, pretty astounding um, you know making racial discrimination explicit um, and uh, to give a sense of the geographic scale of uh, of these programs. Um, this is a map from uh, the Mapping Inequality Group. This is a really fantastic resource. They've um, digitized um, and made freely available redlining maps for, um, for hundreds of cities around the country. Um, and, uh, you know, these programs were huge. So, you know, we can see here that they touched um, uh, much of the, the, at the time, settled uh, United States, most, uh, all large cities, uh, almost all large cities um, were graded here. The um, Hulk in its first two years um, gave, um, gave financing to about one in 10 homes in America. Uh, and the Federal Housing Administration uh, and the GI Bill as well were both much, much larger. That between uh, uh, from FHA's um, start to around 1970, FHA helped 11 million uh, people buy homes. Uh, and about 2% uh, of those mortgages went to uh, went to African Americans to give a sense of um, some of the, uh, the kind of scale of the racial exclusion. Again, uh, home ownership rate before these programs were implemented um, was about 40%, and that jumped to about um, 65% uh, several decades later. So again, these programs are really crucial for um, creating the American homeownership society uh, and then segregating it. So to uh, kind of, you know, Hulk was a long time ago, um, and because of that, it's worth thinking about related um, historical processes and, and Hulk's place um, in them as we look at the um, uh, digitized and geo-referenced um, redlining map for, uh, for Chicago. So again, there were other New Deal programs such as the FHA and the GI Bill that inherited Hulk's redlining practices and expanded the use of um, racially restrictive covenants. An excerpt of one um, is here in the upper, uh, the upper right, um, excluding um, uh, people, uh, uh, people of color and as well as Jews from buying property. Um, and these programs, again, funneled billions of dollars away from urban communities of color and towards white suburbs. Um, as home ownership opportunities opened up to white Americans, we were building segregated public housing, using highways to segregate neighborhoods. Um, 
displacing hundreds of thousands disproportionately people of color through urban renewal, or as James Baldwin famously uh, uh, described it, uh, Negro removal. Uh, this conflation of race and lending risk um, constrained housing options for Blacks, creating opportunities for exploitation through practices such as blockbusting. Um, and of course, private lenders followed uh, uh, the federal government here uh, in adopting the redlining practices. Um, uh, and, and some, including Kiangi Yamada Taylor, are gonna um, kind of describe this as a manifestation of, uh, of Jim Crow as well. Um, so, you know, Hulk, of course, didn't invent racism in real estate, but it institutionalized it uh, and pumped, in, again, you know, tr a tremendous amount of money into, uh, into these ideals. Uh, so one of the things that I've done in my research is try to um, kind of measure the effect of, uh, of Hulk on uh, America's racial geography on segregation. So uh, what this figure shows right now is comparing cities that were, um, were appraised uh, by Hulk appraisers, you where those residential security maps were created, uh, to those that were not. Um, uh, we can see that before these policies and immediately after these policies, um, they were these these two groups of cities were about uh, the same uh, uh, had the same levels of black isolation, which is a common measure of of residential segregation. Um, but then, as uh, the FHA and the GI Bill um, and other Kind of powers of suburbanization kicked in, we can see that the gap between appraised and unappraised places really expanded in the middle of the last century um, and has not closed at all. That this is going to create this segregation that was put in place due to um, uh, Hulk appraisals um, was very much like locked in place, this inequality, uh, and it has not declined uh, uh, since, uh, since the middle of the last century. Um, another project that I'm, I'm looking at uh, uh, more recently is exploring uh, the role of Hulk in shaping inequalities in, um, in wealth. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have great historical measures of wealth, but we do have um, decent measures of, um, of self-reported home value going back to 1930. Um, and one of the things that um, I have done is looking again at places that were redlined and comparing them to places that were not. Now I'm looking at metropolitan areas, so a city and its entire suburbs. Um, and so what this figure shows is that is the self-reported value of owner-occupied homes um, for white and black um, households. Um, in places that were redlined and places that were not. Um, and we can clearly see that the gap in um, redlined areas is much, much bigger. It's about $100,000 in terms of home value. So homes uh, owned by whites in redlined metropolitan areas are worth about $100,000 more than homes owned by blacks in those uh, same metropolitan areas. Um, and in, in metropolitan areas that were not uh, appraised, uh, there's still a substantial gap, but it is uh, less than half the size, it's about $45,000. Um, and again, this is in, in 2019. Um, and so uh, these figures together show that there was, uh, there was and continues to be an enormous impact of these, um, again, intentionally um, segregationist uh, uh, housing policies. So I think I'll I'm gonna stop there um, and hand the mic over. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Faber. Um, I look forward to hearing more uh, from you during the Q&A. Um, so uh, I'm next going to introduce uh, Dr. William A. Darity Jr., um, who uh, leads the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. And Dr. Darity is an IRP affiliate, we're uh, happy to note. And I think we can congratulate you today on um, your recent award that your center got on uh, from the WT Grant Foundation to support research on reparations for Black Americans. American descendants of enslaved persons. And I think that news just came out yesterday, if that's right. So uh, congratulations on that. And I think it's directly related to what you're gonna be talking about here today. So uh, welcome, and I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, I'm going to get some support here from Finaba in running the slideshow. Uh, and so uh, I guess I'd like to proceed to the next slide. Uh, 
the contents of this presentation includes a discussion of what does reparations mean, who should be eligible to receive Black American reparations, how should the reparations bill be calculated, and who is responsible for meeting the bill. So next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to share a quotation from Malcolm X that uh, makes a very central point that needs to be emphasized, uh, which is a distinction between pulling a knife out of a stab wound versus healing the wound. Uh, and I would like to propose that pulling the knife out is the equivalent of stopping the harms and damages that are associated with a variety of atrocities that have taken place in the United States but that is not the same as compensating the victimized community for the effects of those harms and damages. And it's the latter that constitutes healing the wound and reparations is an act of healing the wound. Next slide, please. Reparations has three components, acknowledgement, redress and closure. Acknowledgement involves the culpable party admitting that they have, uh, that they have engaged in a grievous injustice and that this admission also must include a commitment to engage in restitution or redress for the grievous injustice. Redress then is the second component of a reparations program. It is the series of steps that are taken to heal the wound. And frequently this has taken the form of monetary payments to the victimized community. Uh, examples include the German government's payments of reparations to the victims of the Holocaust. They include the United States government's payments to Japanese Americans who were subjected to mass incarceration during the course of World War II. And it includes instances in which the US government has made payments, although it's not necessarily the culpable party. One illustration is the, uh, the set of payments that have been made to the individuals who were held hostage in Iran. Uh, at a rate of uh, $10,000 per day, 440 days of uh, captivity, so that the average payment was $4.4 million. Uh, the final component of a reparations program is closure, which is an agreement that's reached between the victimized community and the culpable party that the account is settled. Uh, representatives chosen by the members of the aggrieved community can communicate with the culpable party to establish uh, that, uh, that, the, that the act of restitution is sufficient to treat the debt as having been paid. Uh, exceptions to the closure point only would arise if there's a renewal of the atrocities or there's a new set of atrocities that take place. But in the absence of that, the account is settled. Next slide, please. Here, uh, I want to talk about the criteria for eligibility for reparations, and there are two. Uh, the first is what uh, Kirsten Mullen and I refer to in our book, From Here to Equality, as a, uh, as a lineage standard. An individual would have to demonstrate that they have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. The second criterion is a, uh, is a, um, an identity standard. So an individual would have to demonstrate that they self-identified on an official document for at least 12 years before the adoption of a reparations plan or the adoption of a, uh, of a plan to establish a commission to study reparations that they self-identified as Black, Negro, African-American, or Afro-American. Uh, and so those are the two criteria for eligibility. The bottom line is individuals who are black Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States would be the population that merits reparations from the United States government. Next slide, please. So uh, in the context of the work that we've done in From Here to Equality on Reparations, we emphasize that it is not exclusively a case that's anchored on the harms of slavery. Uh, and in particular, we actually are somewhat repulsed by the phrase slavery reparations. Indeed, 
the period of chattel slavery must be taken into serious consideration as a component of the case for reparations. But we also have to take into account uh, nearly a century of legal segregation in the United States, the period of American apartheid that we refer to somewhat blithely as the Jim Crow era. And then there are ongoing atrocities which include mass incarceration, police executions of unarmed blacks, sustained discrimination in credit housing and employment markets. And then what's central to the analysis that I'm going to proceed with the immense black white wealth disparity in the United States. Uh, Finneba has talked about this at length. Uh, Jacob has talked about some of the uh, important sources or causes of that wealth disparity. But the magnitude of the disparity is such that the average black household has $840,000 less in net worth than the average white household. And this corresponds to a situation in which black American descendants of US slavery constitute about 12% of the nation's population, but possess less than 2% of the nation's total wealth. The argument that we make in From Here to Equality is that it is the black American descendants of US slavery who have had to bear the burden of the cumulative effects of all three of these phases of the nation's trajectory of racial injustice. Next slide, please. So now we're going to discuss how you proceed to calculate what is owed. And in some of the earlier work that I did, an emphasis was placed on the present value of the 40 acre land grants that were promised to the newly emancipated but not delivered. And uh, this 40 acre land grant uh, was, uh, was something that has legendary proportions in, uh, in many conversations in the United States, but it actually was a promise that was made and it was a promise that was not fulfilled. And so um, one way to think about the compensation that's due to contemporary Black Americans is to argue that they should receive the present value of, uh, uh, of, of uh, the 40 acre land grants. And uh, we indicate here how much that would be worth had we uh, looked at the run up of price values on, uh, on, on, the, on the stock exchange. Uh, but in the work that, that's been, uh, been, been done on this topic, the typical estimate runs in the vicinity of four to $6 trillion today. However, the denied land grants were not the only sources of disparity in wealth between uh, blacks and whites that have been transmitted across generations. So next slide, please. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's important to recognize that the way in which these disparities in wealth operate is such that they widen as individuals become older. So uh, a longevity in the United States is associated with a greater disparity in wealth between blacks and whites. Uh, and the, the point at which that disparity becomes apparent is primarily in the years of the individual's fourth decade when they're in their thirties. Uh, and this is because that's the point at which inheritances begin to come into play in a significant way, but also the impact of the types of transmission of resources that are associated with donations that are made while the uh, contributor is still living what we refer to as in vivo transfers, but uh, I think uh, more tautly as gifts. Uh, and so the impact of those kinds of transfers become significant as individuals enter into their thirties. And then the uh, trajectory of differential accumulation of wealth explodes thereafter. On the left side, we have the median. On the right side, we have the mean. Next slide, please. So when we're concerned about closing the black-white wealth gap, the argument that we make in From Here to Equality is that you must target the mean differential rather than the median. Now, people typically want to focus on the median because it, uh, it is not sensitive to outlier values at either end of the distribution. Uh, but in the context of thinking about black-white wealth differences, it's important to think about, about the mean as the target rather than the median. And there, there are three reasons for that. First, I already mentioned that an objective should be to bring the black share of wealth, which is now less than 2%, 
into consistency with the black share of the population, which is about 12%. And that will require us to focus on the mean rather than the median. Secondly, um, if we were to focus exclusively on the median, we would ignore a vast amount of wealth that is held by white Americans. In fact, 97% of the wealth that is held by white Americans is held by those households that have a net worth above the white median. And so uh, if, if we were to, to close the gap solely at the median, we're not really talking about closing the gap. Final point that I'd like to make is that people frequently say, well, this explosive difference in wealth above the median is simply attributable to a handful of white billionaires. Uh, well, there, there are a handful of white billionaires who are extraordinarily wealthy, but 25% of all white households, that's one quarter, have a net worth in excess of $1 million. And that is only true for, uh, that is only true for 4% of black households. So to close the racial wealth gap would require an expenditure that closes the gap at the mean, and this would necessitate an expenditure of approximately $12 trillion. Next slide, please. Okay. So finally, uh, I'd like to discuss the question of culpability or responsibility for payment. And uh, in, uh, in our book, we, make the, we, we offer this quotation. We say black reparations are not a matter of personal or individual institutional guilt. Black reparations are a matter of national responsibility. Next slide, please. So the first point that I'd like to make here is that states and localities don't have the capacity to meet the bill and that it's virtually oxymoronic to talk about local reparations. Why can't they meet the bill? Their total budgets across all state and local governments in the United States amount somewhere in the vicinity, uh, amount to somewhere in the vicinity of $3.1 trillion. And the total bill, as I noted a moment ago, is $12 trillion. Uh, the federal government also has the capacity to do it and the response to the pandemic in terms of assembling uh, three and two trillion dollar expenditure packages at the drop of the hat demonstrates that the federal government can meet the bill. Next slide, please. But finally, it's the federal government that is the culpable party. It is the entity that created the legal and authority framework that produced the atrocities that have resulted in this massive racial wealth gap today. Uh, we can start with the denial of the 40 acres that were promised, while at the same time, the United States government was producing, uh, was providing 160 acre land grants to one and a half million white families in the Western territories as the nation completed its, uh, its colonial settler project. And the, the consequence of that across generations is that it's now estimated that 45 million living white Americans are beneficiaries of the Homestead Act of 1862. In addition, there was a wave of 100 massacres that took place from the end of the Civil War uh, until the 1940s, white massacres that destroyed black communities, resulting in massive loss of black lives, but also, and this is critical in terms of thinking about the wealth gap and the way in which public policy has produced the wealth gap, also resulted in the appropriation of black owned property by the white terrorists, uh, resulting in a further uh, disparity in wealth between blacks and whites. And then, uh, Jacob Faber has talked about redlining and the GI Bill and uh, the homeowners loan corporations activities, discriminatory activities that resulted in differential access to the resources to become homeowners by race in the 20th century. Uh, and then the final thing that I'd like to mention is the work of Dorothy Brown in her recent book, uh, The Whiteness of Wealth, in which she demonstrates that the structure of tax policy in the United States essentially functions as a way in which it strips wealth from, 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 from blacks and promotes wealth accumulation for whites. Um, and so the federal government is the capable party, it is the culpable party, and it needs to meet the bill that is overdue for 155 years.
Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Darity. And if I can invite uh, Professor Otto and Professor Faber to turn their cameras back on, uh, we'll get to Q&A here. I know many of you have already uh, put questions in the Q&A box, and we've been answering some of those uh, typed in. But um, but to start with, I want to go right back to Professor Darity here. We've had a couple of really excellent questions about uh, sort of the implementation of a reparations policy, um, and particularly that some of the folks who have maybe been most harmed by uh, by the atrocities, uh, other factors that you kind of highlight are maybe least able to sort of prove their, um, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I, uh, identity or their heritage uh, in that sense. Can you, I know you've talked about this uh, in the Q&A, but uh, can you kind of talk to about some of the resources and some of the work that you and Kristen Mullen have done about your proposal to address that? Yeah, uh, so in, in, in the final chapter of our, our book, From Here to Equality, where we sketch a plan for reparations, we say that there should be a, a federal agency that would provide genealogical services to claimants for reparations free of charge uh, to assist them in the process of establishing their claims. And then uh, there's a forthcoming book that's a product of, uh, of a group that's, that, that we call the Reparations Planning Committee that will be uh, published by the University of California Press. And one of the chapters in that book is written by an expert black genealogist named Evelyn McDowell. And she demonstrates how in very complicated situations, uh, the, uh, the, um, the ancestry that's linked to individuals who were enslaved can be established. And she provides uh, a couple of very, very compelling illustrations. So, um, so we think that this is entirely feasible. Um, and, uh, as, and the more individuals that you identify as having had enslaved ancestors through a networking process, you can establish that others also share that ancestry. Thank you. Um, for the next question, I want to go to Dr. Otto. And uh, Dr. Otto, I know that a lot of your work focuses on debt, especially student debt. Uh, but we have a question from Tim about um, sort of all the different types of debt. You know, we've got legal debt, prison debt, uh, medical debt, um, and certainly student uh, debt, as you've kind of focused much of your work on. Um, but so I think that he is concerned about sort of the way that these debts can combine, and especially when it comes to garnishments of uh, wages or tax returns, um, they, they kind of have an effect on people's ability. It's a, essentially a tax on future earnings, uh, some might see it. Is there a data source that sort of can you know collect all these things that you know of or what, what do you have to say about that so yeah so th to answer your last question first uh there's uh, there wasn't that great data uh, that collected a lot of information on the household, but the survey and consumer finances has started to ask a lot more detailed questions around debt. They used to kind of aggregate the debt question, but now we see that it's important to kind of disaggregate and, and look at differences by student debt, consumer debt, mortgage debt, auto loan debt. Um, and unfortunately, um, they don't currently include the criminal debt um, um, fines and fees, um, but I know that there is a lot of uh, great work that is going on right now to kind of collect and assess how that is contributing to ongoing, you know, um, wealth differentials as well as depressed uh, economic states across the country and in specific localities and communities. We can we could speak to like the Ferguson report that kind of highlighted the role of fines and fees in kind of exasperating um, exasperating inequalities. Um, I will say though that one of the things that you know that is particular to student loan debt is that you know prior to <laughs> prior to the rise in student loan debt and the massive crisis that we are currently experiencing, there really was not even that much. Uh, of a racial debt differential or to speak of, or and black households actually held less debt in other forms um, historically because they didn't have access to credit markets. They didn't have access you know, to the ability to accumulate debt <laughs> to, to the same extent as white Americans. And there's some great work by uh, sociologist Louise, Faber, um, Louise uh, Seamster who kind of shows the difference of uh, black, black, um, black debt, white debt of how debt has been used to kind of increased uh, wealth among white Americans, but has been detrimental and is particularly into the forms that it's held in, um, in creating wealth accumulation among black Americans and has been penalized for the debt that they hold and student loan debt being a prime example of that. So yeah, thanks for that question. 
For our next question, I want to go to Dr. Faber. Uh, you know, so you've identified in a lot of the data you showed that a lot of these sort of inequalities in uh, real estate values have persisted today. And I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the things that are sort of ongoing that maybe help those inequalities persist, um, specifically like real estate comps, things like that, lending practices that we might want to think about, um, and how that might translate to sort of current policy that we can think about. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And the um, really, when I was doing this work, the kind of stability of that inequality um, was pretty, um, pretty surprising to me, um, given the enormous changes um, in most aspects of American society in the past 100 years, we still see this gap. And, you know, I think there are a lot of really important contributors to that um, across sectors. Um, and, uh, you know, I focus primarily on the, on the housing market and, um, you know, linking what um, uh, Dr. Otto just said to this, you know, to answer this question, um, you know, the biggest debt that most people, most Americans have is, uh, is their mortgage. Um, and so, you know, this is generally, it, it certainly is a debt, but it's not often considered as such in, um, uh, in discussions about economic stability and mobility, um, um, but it is and can be this really powerful tool um, for, uh, for wealth accumulation. Um, however, you know, we don't have to go that far back to the subprime lending boom to show or to see rather um, how, again, kind of racialized distribution of debt um, was uh, just devastating uh, for people of color. Um, uh, other work that I've done has shown that, uh, again, kind of the places that were redlined by Hulk in the 1930s were also the places that had the highest rates of subprime lending uh, in 2006 and the highest uh, rates of foreclosures in the subsequent um, uh, in the subsequent recession. And you know, I think that there's a really clear intergenerational logic that connects these historical practices of exclusion to, um, uh, to even kind of race neutral practices today. Um, and this is really where the teeth of, uh, you know, concepts like structural or institutional racism um, uh, really bite down. Um, George Lipsitz in his um, great book, The Possession of Invest Possessive Investment in Whiteness, um, has this great passage where he is uh, kind of pretending to be um, a, a mortgage lender denying the application of a person of color. Um, and you know, in, in doing so, he says, you know, unfortunately, I can't give you a loan today because um, we have discriminated so effectively against members of your race in the past uh, that you've been unable to accumulate uh, enough wealth for, uh, uh, for home ownership uh, today through things like down payment um, uh, uh, sizes. Uh, and so, um, so there, there's this kind of momentum of inequality um, uh, really shows up quite dramatically when we look at, um, at housing and wealth. Um, and of course, um, uh, educational policy um, is, a, is another huge, huge driver. Thank you for that. Um, for our next question, I'd like to talk to Dr. Darity. We have a we have a few questions in the Q and A that kind of circle around what I think is perhaps a, a common um, reaction to uh, questions about reparations and uh, sort of making the distinction between reparations policies and maybe broader social policies that affect. Uh, that help low-income people, and and I think I think your work has made it clear that these are different things. But I'd, I'd like you to talk about that and kind of how you think about that a little bit, if you would. Yeah. So I, I think that the uh, distinction that I tried to offer through the Malcolm X quote is pertinent here. Uh, the difference between pulling the knife out and healing the wound. Uh, don't have an expectation that reparations is going to eliminate racist attitudes in the United States. The hope is that there would be a sufficient decline in racism so that there would be a political project that could actually come into play to bring uh, reparations into, into reality. But don't expect that there, there's, I would always think there's gonna be 30% of the population 
that will be uh, that will continue to be hostile towards reparations and hostile towards Black Americans. And so, uh, so the question is, how do we manage that thirty percent ultimately? Um, so, uh, so, so from my perspective, there's a need to pull the knife out as well as heal the wound. Both are both are important to do, and so these other kinds of initiatives, like um, improving school quality, uh, like uh, dealing with uh, pol police anti-black violence, all of these things are things that need to be done in addition to the provision of reparations. Uh, but I will say this: if the average black household had an additional eight hundred and forty thousand dollars their political capability would be enhanced in such a way that they could actually put pressure on local school boards, on uh, city councils and the like to really alter the kinds of practices that are taking place. So there's a sense in which reparations could contribute to curbing racist practices. But, uh, but yes, uh, uh, in, in general, I think both, has to ha both have to happen. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Otto, we, we've got a couple questions about uh, uh, policy options, possibilities that could help to address uh, some of the things that you were talking about um, in terms of just like the precariousness of the black middle class. Uh, you know, I know we, we often hear about things like financial literacy, but, um, but I think that, you know, it is, uh, and, and that's that's one of the questions in there. But I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can talk more about policies that um, in addition to what we're talking about here with reparations, but other things that might help uh, to address these these things. Sure. Yeah. And I, I, I know uh, you <laughs> don't want to talk about financial literacy, but I am going to address that uh, directly because I think of that it's something that I hear often when I present my work um, and not to discount the role of financial education and financial literacy um, for everyone. I do not think that it is the solution to uh, closing racial wealth inequality. I think it's important, you know, you know, I think Dr. Darity likes to say, and I like to say, you know, you need to have some resources in order to manage. <laughs> so first, let's work. Let's worry about getting the resources into, you know, into the households, into people's, um, into people's families to have to have them manage. And we can really think about something like as um, as close as like the COVID nineteen crisis, when people were unable to work and were pulled, out, you know, or um, had to make decisions with regard to the ability to support their families or risk their health, right? And so how are we able to coalesce and what policies did we lean on in order to support families in this very economically vulnerable time? Um, and, and who had to make those decisions, you know, um, due to the fact that they maybe did not have the wealth <laughs> to, to support them or buffer them to make those, you know, easy decisions to, to work from home or had to go in. And so it's thinking about really like, what are some you know, income supports that we can uh, talk about? I know Sandy and has done some work on federal job guarantees and, you know, just thinking about ways that we can bring more resources um, economic resources into into households and into into uh, you know uh, vulnerable households so that they can support themselves to do what to do what wealth does right like like I spoke about in the definition to help them um, be able to insure against risk against shocks but also allows people to plan right allows people to think you know to to not put themselves their families at risk you know of health of at death um, you know in, in, in death as we've seen in the, over the last year. Okay. So we are running up on our time limit for today. So uh, but before uh, we kind of sign off for the day, I want to give each of our presenters just kind of an opportunity to leave us with a parting thought. Um, you know, what what are you paying attention to? What are areas that uh, you're excited to see further research on or things you're either hopeful or pessimistic about? Um, you know, and Dr. Faber, I'm wondering if you would start off for us here. Sure. Um, uh, I'm, I really appreciate um, uh, Dr. Otto's response to the question about financial literacy. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And um, one statistic that I, um, uh, I often cite in, in these kinds of discussions is that at the height of the subprime lending boom in 2006, uh, Black and Latino borrowers making um, over a quarter million dollars a year were more likely to get subprime loans than white borrowers making $35,000 a year. Um, so to me, that pretty much nixes the financial literacy um, uh, piece. Um, but circling back to your uh, question about conclusions here, 
Uh, I think that the, the take home and um, uh, all of the presentations really spoke to this is that the inequalities that we see today are, um, are the result of intentional decisions made by, uh, by the government, um, governments at, at all levels. Um, and uh, again, we have this, uh, because of this, we have this moral, moral uh, um, obligation to, to address them. Uh, looking forward, I, or rather, I mean, looking uh, contemporaneously, I continue to be extremely concerned about what um, the short, middle, and long-term consequences of the pandemic um, are going to be um, in terms of uh, the inequalities in housing and wealth and segregation that we've talked about uh, today. Uh, we know from research on um, the last, the, the Great Recession and pretty much every other economic contraction that uh, people of color um, are um, routinely hit hardest by these um, enormous economic shocks um, and often are left out of uh, whatever recovery comes. Um, there's, a, there's a really troubling um, uh, op-ed in the, in the New York Times today um, just showing data on the geography uh, of people who are behind on rent. Um, and uh, that kind of looming, it's going to contextualize in this idea of a looming threat of eviction, um, I think is, is going to be held over millions of households disproportionately poor and people of color um, for quite some time. And this kind of forced mobility through eviction and foreclosure um, can be uh, quite devastating uh, for, for families uh, in the short term, um, as well as in the long term, looking at things like um, wealth accumulation. Yeah. Dr. Darity, would you uh, be willing to go next? Uh, sure. Um, so let me just say that uh, my my uh, my optimism is is raised greatly by the fact that it appears that uh, in 2004, about four percent of white Americans endorsed reparations for Black Americans, and today it's about thirty percent. So uh, still not a majority, but it's, uh, it's, it's moving in a direction that's quite favorable for the prospects for uh, reparations taking place. Uh, I, have, uh, uh, I do have a note of pessimism, which is I think that there are uh, a couple of instances in which what appears to be victories are actually creating obstacles. One of these sets of victories is associated with the wave of uh, the wave of local reparations programs that are sweeping towns as well as states across the United States. And as I pointed out, if your goal is to eliminate the racial wealth gap, states and localities simply cannot do it. And I wish that they would stop calling their local initiatives reparations because I anticipate that when we get to the point at which we can have an opportunity for a federal program, uh, there are going to be opponents who will say, well, you've already got it. It's been done in all of these states and localities. Uh, and then the other, uh, other non-victory is, uh, is the growing support for HR 40, uh, congressional legislation to establish proposals for reparations at the congressional, uh, at, at the federal level. Um, and I put in the chat, uh, a document that indicates what the reservations are uh, that we have about HR 40. Don't think it will get us from here to there. Dr. Otto, you started us off today. I'm hoping you'll finish this up okay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I have much more to add. I, I agree with what Dr. Faber said about, um, I think a lot about what COVID-19 will mean for uh, the Black community and, and inequality. Um, we know like from the past recession, it took us longer to recover. Um, and then just as it looked like there were signs of a recovery, then we have another um, another uh, shock that hit. Um, hit, And this one is at the nexus of health and um, and wealth and labor. Um, and so, we, you know, we have there, we need multiple <laughs> policies <laughs> uh, uh, in order to address the, the many um, you know, repercussions of what we've been experiencing and continues to, um, uh, and, and, and I should say education as well, 
Um, so I think you know we need a, co a concerted effort among you know the best and the brightest ex uh, experts um, who are doing work within wealth, but also in the, any other buckets as well to get us to understand what this means for um, for the stability and the growth of uh, you know the black community and the black middle class and 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 you know and our society as a whole. Absolutely, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I want to thank the three of you so much. I feel like we packed so much into an hour here, and I, I just um, and I'm also thankful for everyone that joined us. Uh, I just want to note that um, sort of our next online event that uh, folks can join um, on August 27th, we're going to be having uh, a panel organized by Jim Ziliak and Bradley Hardy, uh, looking at tax policy for uh, low-income Americans, and that's actually going to be a three-hour uh, event with a number of papers presented, especially looking at EITC and tax policy innovations. Uh, so you can watch out for an email about that. Um, for this webinar, uh, we are going to be sending out the recording later on this week. So everyone that registered, uh, we'll send that on out to you. Uh, but again, Dr. Otto, Dr. Faber, and Dr. Darity, I'm just really, really uh, um, so happy that uh, the three of you made the time to join us today and to share all the work that you've been doing. So um, thanks so much and uh, so long now.